Happy Mushoka Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Trek, the Mushoka Tensei Jawas Reincarnation novel series. We are on volume 15, chapter 10. Edis is in the chat. <laughs> we have Edis in the chat, all over the chat. This is literally just Edis. Edis, 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 Edis. Which is probably really nice for all the Edis fans out there that we're getting just nothing but her. Um, really great set of chapters. I honestly have read to chapter 12, but I'm not sure how far I'm going to get. We're kind of in that later part of a volume where I'm like concerned about fitting it all into the remaining <laughs> Mushoko Mondays. I think right now, currently scheduling probably two more or this one, another one, but we'll, we'll see. I, I, I told myself last time I was going to get over the whole carryovers to the next volume and just do whatever works for the space of what time I want to make a Mushoko Monday, but we'll see. We'll see where things go. Uh, I didn't really have many notes from last week to go over. I think I covered pretty much everything. I think the only remaining thing that kind of came to my mind as I was editing was what Orsted could do that could protect Rudius. The only thing that came to mind was I thought that there was a possibility that Orsted would tell Rudius in order to protect your family, go to the Mills Continent. I, I, I Something just jumped in my mind, a thought, that when Rudius was traveling back from the Demon Continent after the displacement incident, he never got a visit from the Man God while he was on the Mills Continent. Well, additionally, yes, technically when he went down to, you know, save Zenith, he never got a visit when he was on the Begrit Continent. But I think that was probably for a reason. He already told him what he wanted to tell him. Rudius went there. Rudius achieved what he wanted him to achieve. But over here on the Mills Continent, it seemed kind of odd that he never got a visit. And so I thought there was a possibility that that Maybe not the fact that it's Mills Continent, not the fact that it's the Mills Churches there, but just the fact that that is a, an area, a region that is blocked from his view, that he can't get to. Or possibly, sometime in the past, maybe the Dragon God made something there that shielded him from the Man God. But yes, as I read chapter 12, <laughs> that's obviously not the case. He, he suggests something else, but it was still an interesting thought. I, I, I think it's one of those things where I think of something, I find sort of an answer while I'm reading, but at the same time, it still sort of applies that thought process of why, why not on the demon, why not on the Mills continent? What's different there? Or does it just so happen that the, the man God just didn't care to talk to him at that point? But anyways, that said, let's jump into this Mr. Monday with chapter 10, Edis Grey Rat, part one. Edis is in the chat. Edis is in the chat. Nya is in the chat. Reese woke up early to have a run and practice swings with Norn. He returned to the house, gave Sylvia a hug, greeted Aisha and Lilia, before braiding Roxy's hair as she was still half awake. He then fetched Zenith for breakfast, who was in the garden quietly watching their pet Treant bite. It seems like, <laughs> based on this and a later comment, it's like, Zenith really likes <laughs> that, that little Treant. <laughs> they had a big meal with the entire family. In other words, he was back to his old, peaceful routine. I, I, I did find it kind of interesting that after this whole ordeal fighting the Dragon God, Rudius just feels better. Like, this, it, like a huge weight is off his shoulders, which honestly, for me, as I was reading this, I'm going, why? Why is, why is it, why does he feel so different now? Is it because rather than somebody he's never trusted was his ally to fight something that he knew was impossible and that created all this tension within him, this anxiety? Why now, when that's still a threat and he is now working with Orsted, does it suddenly feel like, why does he suddenly feel at peace. Is it because he knows that Orsted is powerful? Like he's he's experienced firsthand Orsted is powerful. Whereas the man god is deceiving and manipulative and, and works with other people to get to somebody. It's sort of interesting. There's a side of me that almost believes it's purely just based on the idea that he's no longer working towards fighting Orsted. And that's something that he can see all the time. Visible threat. It wasn't as if nothing ever happened. He tried to kill the dragon god Orsted was utterly defeated, but somehow came out alive. He glanced at his hands, squeezing them into a fist. He could feel his fingertips press against his palms on both sides. <laughs> Finally, Rudius gets both his hands back. Well, he, get, he gets the other hand back, but yeah, returning the other one. He's gonna miss his prosthesis. Well, I mean, he can still use it. It's a, it's a glove. He can just technically slip it over. On that day, when he bowed to Orsted and swore his loyalty, he made good on his promise and healed him. Not only did his right arm regenerate, as a bonus, his left hand returned as well. Orsi then proceeded to cast another spell on Rudius, handed him a bracelet that he'd be wearing on his arm, and then departed with these words. I'll be in touch once you have regained your mana. I'm still kind of curious what the spell was. 
we find out later what the bracelet was, but what was the spell? That That's the interesting part. And I think that's probably maybe some sort of mark. I was kind of considering it possibly being a mark. Reese to this moment was wearing that bracelet on his left arm. Unclear of its function. Maybe it accelerated the mana regeneration or prevented the man god from spying on him. The latter seemed possible. Ten days had passed since the battle, but the man god hadn't appeared in Ruiz's dreams. Also, Orsett says something about protecting him from his influence. Then again, it could just be something that he gave to everyone under his command, like a dragon god badge. <laughs> Let's look around with a badge. In the end, Orsted defeated him, and he was now his subordinate. He betrayed the man god and joined forces with his enemy. He'd probably be wearing the bracelet for the rest of his life. Though, Rudis had no regrets about this choice. To be honest, it felt nice betraying that faceless bastard. And he was more relieved than anxious. Again, it's very interesting that this, this changes him so much, that he's now breathing a sigh of, of relief. Because honestly, yes, <laughs> for most of this volume, Ruiz has been in a state of just panic. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Now suddenly, ah, I'm good. Yeah, technically I do kind of agree with part of that where it's like, I stuck it to him. I finally stuck it to that man. <laughs> but yeah, I think the other side of it is just, again, I, 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 some, I, I believe or I feel like I, if I was in his shoes, that would be the, the mindset there is I have this guy here in front of me versus something that's far away that I can never talk to. The lesser of two evils, I guess. But again, I think there's a part of it with that last conversation. That that last conversation in the last chapter was that idea of feeling that the ma that the dragon god specifically wasn't saying wasn't whispering sweet nothings in his ears. He wasn't promising him anything. He was he was real. He wasn't a door to door salesman as he called the man god once before. There was no turning back. And if Orsa turned out to be a piece of work himself, he couldn't double cross him. The die had been cast. There's another aspect there of the, like the idea of like I chose this and I'm gonna live with it, like just accepting it. While possible that Rudius was doing the exact thing the man god wanted which I still question, it was too late to worry about that. <laughs> I I don't know. Th th I had that thought occur to me. I, I think I mentioned it when I was talking about the idea when um, the man god said, you know, when there's some sort of crisis in your family, I can offer you advice. And my thought process there was like, it almost feels like he knows what's going to happen. He knows that Rudius is going to go fight the man god, knows he's going to lose, and is preparing for something after that. Like he knows this is an inevitability. But he's preparing for after that. Because there's a possibility that when Edis arrives in Shariah, which she was going to already, that she would push Ruiz to fight the Dragon God. Or at least set something in play that will cause that. Maybe she leaves him to go fight him and he decides to go with her. In all honesty, Rudius had a gut feeling that Orsid would prove more trustworthy than the Man God. Again, I agree with that. Something about him reminded Rudius of Rajard in a way. That was an interesting line. When I read that, I'm like, that technically makes sense. Like, I can I can totally see that. That that can be something that could trigger some sort of comfort in Rudius. He acts sort of like Rajard. Rajard's always stone-faced, very, very tall, and oh, and very rugged. And he can see that same thing in Orsted. No nonsense. Destroy things. That was technically... Orsted is, Orsted is very close to Rajard when Rudius first met him. Again, very cold, very calm, very stern, and yes, very so much about a one-track mind. He didn't have Rajard's strong sense of pride, or his affection for children, <laughs> that's obvious. <laughs> but unlike the man-god, who just watched passively, Orsted seemed like the type to punch his way through his problems. Again, I think there's, a, there's something to be said about somebody that is willing to get their own hands dirty. I, it's like the idea of trusting the businessman versus, you know, the blue collar man. The one that's got to get his hands dirty when he offers you advice versus offered advice from a businessman who all he does is tell other people to get the job done. How does this machine work? The guy that works on it's going to know, not the guy who bought it. Either way, a weight came off his shoulders and he was breathing easier these days. While ahead was a bumpy road, at least he made it over that steep mountain. After the fight, Sylphie was sobbing and Roxy gave him a stern talking to. They both insisted that they would have stopped him if he was more honest about the dangers. They also expressed their fears about his new alliance with Orsted, but he justified it as an option for the short term, leading them to grudgingly accept it. Returning home and assuring his family he was fine, he immediately went to bed and slept for a whole day. When he finally awoke, he went around and visited all of his friends and allies to let them know that he lost to Orsted and joined his service. <laughs> <laughs> like the dragon god, the one that everybody's fearing. You're like, yeah, I work for him now. <laughs> I wonder if there was like a, a tone of like pride. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm working for Orsted now. <laughs> I mean, it worked well with uh, Nanahoshi. She got a lot of contacts that way. Of all of them, Pettigoose looked the most relieved. This is loaded. 
<laughs> Understandable for sure. Even with the flying fortress, you wouldn't want to make enemies out of that guy. I, it really immediately goes to the obvious choice here and the idea that Pettigus is relieved when he came to him and said, Hey, Pettigus, I lost to Orsted, but I joined his forces and everything. Pettigus kind of like, he just kind of sighed relief, looked relieved. So Rudius assumes, okay, yeah, he probably thinks that Orsted would come after him because I lost to him and I was, you know, here in his fortress and he's afraid that the dragon got to come after him. I don't think that's the case. I think honestly that Pettigus didn't want Rudius to die. There's part of it because yes, when Rudius first met him, there was this thought process or this, this idea that there was going to be a son from Rudius. That the two of them, him and Sylphie, were marked in some way. And that they were going to produce a son. And that son was, was prophesied or something, and Pettigus wanted to know when he was born so that he can name them. I think Pettigus might be relieved that, okay, I didn't lose that kid. <laughs> I was supposed to get that kid from him, possibly. And I, I, I nearly lost it. There's also an idea that, yes, very rare chance here, Pettigus just doesn't want Ruiz to die. Ruiz did something really good for him. And so he sort of became somebody that he wants to be around. And I'm, 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 I'm struggling with words here and saying things like he likes Rudius or whatever. Yeah, he might just likes his presence, wants him to stick around. Again, he gave him something he was working to achieve for hundreds of years, and he finally got it because of Rudius. I think he kind of likes him. At some point, Rudius realized that everyone's start of look was because his hair had gone white. According to Pettigus, it was a common side effect from using a massive amount of mana in a short time. It probably was the reason that Sylphie's hair color changed after the displacement incident. He kind of alluded to that before when they were traveling home after he became King Tear. However, Ruiz was already seeing some brown roots in his hair. Unlike Sylphie, his hair seemed to be temporary. Not that he minded either way, at the moment they had a matching look. Again, this is, this is one of those things that I was kind of assuming would be the case with the last chapter, is that yes, he probably used a bunch, his hair went white, but I didn't think that it was going to stay. Because I really do think that Sylphie's situation is very different. One of my theories is that she's somehow tied to Laplace. That she has the green hair from Laplace, just like Rajard. She has that green hair, and when she was falling, she used so much mana, it drained the curse. Because they keep tying the green to curse. Rajard had green hair. It's the curse. And she pulled all that out when she used so much mana. But unlike Rudius, where his natural color is brown, and it's going to grow back that way, her natural, supposedly natural hair color is not uh, green. It is white. And so she pulled that curse, that green, out of her and used that mana. There was no telling how the man god would react to the betrayal. So, Ruiz was on edge at first. So far, there was nothing out of the ordinary, and he was feeling fine. His body was recovering, and he can sense his mana refilling. On that note, it seemed that Orsted knew the secret behind his large mana capacity. He called it the Laplace Aspect. Again, I was kind of, I was kind of curious if I missed that. I'm like... I think that's the first time they've ever called it an aspect. <laughs> Rudy thought, whatever that was. He figured that he'd probably explain more at some point. He'd just have to be patient. Putting that aside, there was one thing that had changed about his daily life. There was a new regular at the dinner table, Edis Grey Rat. She followed them back to Soraya and occupied the guest room on her own initiative. On the other hand, Ghislaine stayed at a nearby inn. It wasn't clear why, but maybe seeing Zenith in her current state was too much of a shock. Or maybe she was giving them some space. I wonder. I, I, I truly do wonder. When I read this, I was kind of curious. Like, yeah, I, I, I can kind of see both working. Like, this is one of those rare, <laughs> rare Rudeus moments where I think he hits the nail on the head with both situations. I don't necessarily think the first is the case. I don't know. I don't know Ghislaine enough. I know Ghislaine is a very passionate person. She doesn't express it. And she even admits herself. She's very much like Edis. She doesn't know how to communicate. But yeah, trying to get how much Ghislaine loved Zenith. I don't know. I've never gotten that indication from conversations around Ghislaine from her perspective and everything, which is not much. <laughs> it's literally like a brief moment in volume two and then the whole displacement incident at the end of volume two. I don't really get a, too much opportunity to get a sense of how much she cared for Paul and Zenith and Elise and Talhand. Um, and yes, Geese. I almost, I almost forgot about Geese. <laughs> I can kind of see it. I can see her having some sort of care for Zenith, but I don't know. And it's been a long time since she's seen uh, Zenith. It, it, she could have completely forgotten about her. So yeah, it's my, like I'm 99% sure it's probably later. She's giving, she's giving Edis that space so that she can work her magic and get with Rudius, which I think is kind of a negative effect. I mean, she eventually kind of pushes Rudius, but she could have probably been there to support Edis. 
While living with them, Edis tended to wander off now and then, but most of the time was spent hanging around the house. She watched Sylphie cook, Roxy prepare classes, or Aisha and Lilia doing housework. Sometimes she even stared at Zenith and Lucy for no apparent reason. When she wasn't out and about, observing family members seemed to be the default activity. Reese did notice a small troubled frown on her face when she observed Roxy or Sylphie. Yeah, already right here, I know she's trying to figure out where she's going to fit in. <laughs> it's one of those things of like, okay, what are you doing? Ah, uh, yeah, I can't do that. Okay, what are you doing? Ah, uh, yeah, I can't do that. Okay, what are you doing? Ah, uh, yeah, that's going to be difficult. Like, I can totally see Edis right here going, okay, I told myself I want to be a part of his family. So let me see what the family does. Let's see what normal people do. And I think that's a lot of it what it is, is that whole thing of like, this girl has been, she spent most of her time, her life training or technically a lot of her life being a brat. <laughs> then eventually it started to being trained to be an adventurer. Then she get displaced. Then her whole life is basically surviving with Rudeus. And then when she gets home, she goes off and she becomes, she start, starts trying to become a swordswoman. So she doesn't know family. She doesn't know normal lifestyle. Everybody that she stayed with for five years up at the Sword Sanctum, none of those people know family. None of those people are family. I mean, there's families up there, obviously, but they're not, normal families. These are swordsmen. They don't know how to cook, make, you know, they could probably cook <laughs> the normal things. Anyways, you know what I'm getting at? So yeah, she's probably observing all this stuff and figuring out where she can fit in. How, how, where can I fit in in this picture? That everything's flowing. It's a, it's a nice oiled machine. You know, Aisha and Lily are doing their thing. Sylphie's doing her thing. Roxy's got her job. How do I fit in? I can't figure it. I can't find that spot. I'd be curious what she was doing when she leaves the house. Maybe it's just to think, get out and think, go to a quick goblin slaying event or something. Edis had changed a lot since he last seen her. She had a real presence now. She was tall for a woman and carried herself with confidence. Her style suited her. She wore the same leather jacket that Ghislaine did. Flexible black pants, white top over dark undershirt. It was an outfit she could fight in, but also underscored her fit look. She wasn't a mass of muscles though, more so lean and lithe. This is one of the things that bother me. It's like every time he talks about Edis, like her her look, he's always like, she's got so many muscles. Man, this girl's muscled out. But she doesn't show it. Like, it's one of those things of like, I don't want to scare away people from liking Edis by saying that she's a muscly woman. And most people kind of get that a default thought of what a muscly woman looks like. No, no it's not that though. She, it's like, I can see muscles, but I can't see muscles. It's just kind of like this back and forth. It's like even later on seeing an image um, in this in this particular set of chapters, it's like, yeah, I can finally see her. She still looks like Edis. She still looks cute. Where's all the muscle? He keeps talking about the muscle, but I don't see the muscle. <laughs> it's all under pudge. It's, it's all under, un, under fatty. <laughs> to be honest, once he started looking at her, it was a real challenge to stop. It didn't hurt that her chest was large. Waist thin, but curvy. Over five years, her once childish face also acquired a sharp and striking beauty. She shed the girl he'd known and become a young woman. Maybe that was why it was hard to strike a conversation with her. It may have been easier to catch up right after the battle, but he missed his window while informing everyone of the situation. The other problem was that his heart began to race every time he looked at her too long. This was nice. When I read this part, it was like, okay, he does love her. Now, and it's an oddity because... What was I saying in the previous Mishuka Monday? I put a lot of emphasis on the idea that I think the reason why Edis has to show up to save Rudeus from Orsted was because it was fitting a thematic layout that Refugian did for Rudeus. That every woman that he loves is because they saved him. He says that to Sylphie when Sarah leaves. Well, what makes you love somebody? Oh, well, it's always about they came and saved me. This is the common, common denominator. And I... And I honestly felt, and I think I, I mentioned it back then, I honestly feel like it's because Rudeus doesn't know love. Like, he is just, he's fumbling through this. Like, he is trying really hard to figure this stuff out as he's going along, and he sucks at it. Let's be truthful, he sucks at love. He And it's a lot to do with understanding what love is. It just naturally happens, and he's not really sure what it means. And he even does a little bit of that in this, in this chapter, where he's realizing, what was this? He jokes about it, like, yeah, I know what it is, I'm not stupid. But it is one of those things of like, do you, <laughs> do you really understand it? So it, it, it seemed like back then he was just equating the two things because it was a common denominator. Well, Sylphie saved me and Roxy saved me and I love them. So obviously it's people that saved me. And so I thought thematically that Edis had to save him from Orsted in order for him to accept that I, he loves her. Surprising. He never brings it up. 
I think he does bring it up, but he doesn't equate that. He might later on, but right here, he's not equating that. And I think what that the reason for that is that he's already loved her. He loved her a long time ago. And now when she's returned, he, yes, a lot of that is his beauty. It's her, her body, all that kind of stuff. But he's infatuated by her. He can't stop thinking about her. He's just, he's just absorbed by her. She's got this gravity pull. And again, I think that's kind of interesting that it's not going by that theme that Roxy and, and Sylphie is kind of attached to for him, but simply because I can't keep my eyes off her. There's something about her. She's beautiful and all this kind of stuff. I was really hoping that there would be more, more recalling his whole life experience with her, how much time he spent with her. But I, I think it works both ways. I think it still kind of works in the end because I think there's a, there's a small part where he sort of recalls how much she's changed. And it kind of works for it. Despite convincing himself that they needed to talk, somehow he couldn't find the right moment. Every time he went to say something, that intense gaze would lock on him. She's like, yes, Rudy. <laughs> yes, let's talk. The pitter-patter in his chest would go into overdrive, causing him to avert his eyes. Was this terror that he was feeling? That's, that's the joke right there. When I was reading this part, I'm like, are we really going back to clueless protagonist mode, Rudius? He said that was a joke. He knew exactly what was going on. He had fallen hard in love with Edis for a second time. She sure won him over quick. But in his defense, she did dash in and save him when all hope was lost. Yes, he does reference it right here. I do acknowledge that. She even held the dragon god Orsted himself at bay and risked her life to protect his. She looked damn good doing so. So it wasn't like Rudius could blame himself. He was an infatuated schoolgirl. He called himself Woodius. <laughs> we used that term before. <laughs> Given that and the approval from Sylphie and Roxy, Rhys just had to ask her to marry him, but it wasn't that simple. Yeah, technically it is. Rhys learned from Aisha that Edis has spent years undergoing harsh training to fight Orsit at his side. Their battle at the Red Worm's lower jaw left a deep impression on her. Her seeing him as he was experimenting with disturbed magic gave her the thought that he was planning on defeating Orsted one day. Rhys thought that him and Edis were closely matched back then, but she decided that she wasn't strong enough to fight alongside him as an equal. That's why she went off to train with the best. From her perspective, he'd basically betrayed her. She went off for a long overseas trip to return to a cheater boyfriend that shacked with two women. I do like this part where it's sort of, um, it's sort of a, an obvious conclusion, but a misunderstanding. Like even now, <laughs> we're going to get into another line here where he's talking about misunderstandings. Even now, there's a misunderstanding happening. Yes, technically, that is true. And we've seen that from Edis' perspective. She went to go get stronger because she's seen Rudy is sitting there practicing. And in her mind, she's like, he's so amazing. Even after nearly dying, he literally pretty much died. After nearly dying, he's going to get stronger and go fight him, get revenge. I want to stand at his side. I want to help him. And that's her whole life has been, or at least the last five years, is trained to be at his side for that moment. So yes, it, it does make sense right here that he feels like, man, yeah, that's it's kind of like betraying her. I'm choosing to side with the guy that she trained to fight for me. She trained that long to fight alongside me against him, and I just joined him. It's, I'm betraying her. I'm, I'm betraying her long training. But he doesn't know. It's kind of interesting that it never really kind of gets brought up. It's interesting that we know that Edis at some point chose, I can't beat Orsted anyways. So I don't think it really matters. I still think she doesn't like Orsted, obviously, because... This is a guy that traumatized her. Took, almost took her beloved away twice now. But she knows that she can't beat Orsted. So if Rudius chooses not to fight Orsted, she's not going to complain. There was so many misunderstandings involved. And he explained it all in his letter. You never knew for sure with Edis, but he assumed that she understood the situation. That didn't mean that she was ready to accept it. With her personality, he expected her to charge at him with a kitchen knife someday. Under these circumstances, it felt a little wrong to ask her to marry him. There was also the fact that she was behaving kind of strangely and hard to figure out what she was thinking. <laughs> it's Edis. The old Edis was kind of a willful, headstrong brat, charging straight into action without thoughts of consequences. He was expecting her to say, I love you, Rudius. That means you get to marry me. Get in my room. We're going to make love all night. You hear that, everyone? Rudius is mine. Get those other women out of here. Like, just kind of storm in, take over the house, kick everybody else out. He's mine. Nobody else gets him. I can see that. Yes, old Edis could totally see that. 
it's kind of funny that he's like, this is the Edis I know. And she's crazy, and she'd do something crazy like that. And I, that would make sense to me, and I'd be comfortable with that. Like, that, I would accept that because that's her. I know how to, I know how to manage that at, that at this point. Right now, I can't figure her out, so I'm, I'm more scared of her. <laughs> like, she's calm and trying to learn how to fit in. I just don't know that. Instead, she hadn't said anything of the kind. She wasn't really asserting herself at all, in fact. He'd never seen her this quiet and subdued. She's grown up. <laughs> he had a theory that could explain all this. Two weeks ago... She risked her life to protect him from Orsted. But that point, she was clinging to some unrealistic fantasy about him. Up until this day, she believed that Rudius had spent the last five years training like she had. That wasn't close to being true. He had put in efforts to grow stronger, but nothing compared to her. Agreed. She spent literally the entire five years training, whereas him was like, no, I'm strong enough. I'll never be as strong as Orsted. Okay, I think I need to get stronger. <laughs> Other than his daily physical training. But yeah, I can see that. I can see him feeling like, do I do I look like a wuss to her? Do I look pathetic to her? Crawl, crawl, like he says right here, ruthlessly being beat down by Orsted and Edis arriving to watch me crawl pathetically through the dirt. Sit there in front of this guy and beg him to not kill me. Beg him to let me follow him. Again, he thinks she sees this and I look pathetic. But we know from Edis' perspective, she knows Orsted is unbeatable. She said that. He's a tower I'll never climb. She just hoped that Rudius had the power to do it and that she would help him do it. But her? No. I, it's impossible. She understands how powerful Orsted is. To top it off, he picked up two wives with some less flattering rumors circling around town. It wasn't a surprise that she may have felt disillusioned. Again, I can see, I can understand him seeing this. I mean, even she had a little bit of conflict when she was coming to town. It is going to, it's one of actually one of those funny things is that we get from her perspective when she was traveling there, she heard those rumors and she liked, she was okay with them all. Like none of them bothered her. The only rumors that she, she didn't like was the ones around Roxy and Silpy because it made her it, it obviously hurt her. Like, he has these two wives. And it seemed like he really, really likes them. And I don't fit the quota that it seems like the two of them carry. Maybe she wasn't going to say anything. Because she was planning on leaving soon. The more he thought about that possibility, the more he felt nervous starting a conversation. He was scared she'd reject him. What if she fixed those steely eyes on him and said, I don't give a damn about you anymore. He would deserve it. <laughs> but it would feel like a punch in the gut. Then again, if she wanted to say that, wouldn't she have sooner? Good point. Again, I have a, a, a rare Rudius W moment. <laughs> Rudius actually figures this out. She would have left a long time ago. Why would she be walking around the house, watching, observing what everybody's doing, if she didn't care about staying there? She's trying to figure out how to fit in. Even conflicted, they need to talk it through. He'd have to grow a spine and ask her what her plans were. If he could ever find the moment or open his mouth. Edis was also keeping quiet too. Still, if it was possible, he wanted to clear things up before Orsted got in touch with him. As Rudius was stuck in thought, Roxy hit him with an unexpected question. <laughs> Roxy over here like, um, obvious question here, but so how'd it go? <laughs> so when are you planning on holding the wedding party for Edis? The, the wedding party? Right. I, I mean, you held one for me, so I assumed that you'd be doing the same for her. I'll take the day off work for it. So I was hoping that you could let me know when it was going to happen. He was at a loss for words. <laughs> After an awkward pause... Roxy looked him in the eyes and frowned. <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't even talked to her about this yet. We discussed it to great length before she even showed up, didn't we? She was right, of course. He'd settled it with everyone, and they were ready to accept Edis. Aisha was willing from the start. But even Norn was treating her like part of the family now. That's so cool. That is so cool. And we all, we we find out later why that was. And it's literally what I assumed was going to happen. Like, I was like, Edis is a, is a shoe in Like, it's going to be super easy to win over Norn. Because all she's got to do is train her. And that, that was a thought process way before all this crap happened. Was that the way that they were going to get Edis to come into Shariah to begin with. Was that Rhys was going to send off to the Sword Sanctum. To have somebody train Norn. And poop, here comes Edis just shows up. In fact... He noticed that Norn and Edis talking happily about Rajurd a couple times. That's the other thing. That's the other thing. Yes, they both love Rajurd. Anybody that is around, I'm, I'm surprised Aisha didn't love Rajurd as much. I mean, we never really get from Aisha's perspective how much she cares for Rajurd. I think she was just too busy. Yes, technically Rajurd with Edis aided in saving her and her mother. 
But even after their travels to the north, she never really talks about Rajard, unless I'm forgetting a, a moment. It seemed like everybody, all kids, grew up loving Rajard, <laughs> that have experience with Rajard. They seem to be getting along better than you expect. Nobody was against this marriage. He was just holding it up with his cowardice. Rudy, you can't put this off forever. Roxy was pointing her finger in the air with her best stern big sister pose. <laughs> I want to see this. And you really shouldn't keep Edis waiting any longer. Waiting? Of course. She's expecting you to say, jump into my arms or what have you. Roxy emphasized this point by throwing her arms wide open. It was extremely cute. Hmm, you really think Edis wants to hear that from me? Are you sure you're not just thinking of your own fantasies? <laughs> what? Come on, don't tease me. You need to take this serious, Rudy. She threw her hands in exasperation, puffing her cheeks sulkily. He was teasing at her reflexively, but he did need to give it some thought. Was Edis really waiting for him to make the move? It didn't seem like her style. Th that is true. I mean, I can, I can understand that. He can totally see her, like, if she's not jumping at me, if she's not proactively coming after me, then she probably doesn't want to be with me because that's always been her style. But... A lot has changed over those five years, and he doesn't, he hasn't, he hasn't, gone, he hasn't grown accustomed to that new change. Then again, Roxy never led him wrong. She was kind of God whose advice you could actually rely on, <laughs> not like the man God. With her push, he had no reason to hesitate. He had to show courage and approach Edis, tell her how he felt, and see what she had to say about it. If she laughed at his face, he just gets Silphy and Roxy to cheer him up. First, though, he threw his arms wide and declared, Jump into my arms, Roxy. You're not even listening to me, are you? She trailed off, glanced around, to see if anyone was around before hopping into his arms. Isn't there, princess? Wouldn't want to jostle a baby in your belly too much. Not to worry. They need a little exercise now and then if they want to stay in shape. He wasn't sure if that worked, but he leave it to the experts. As he sat her down on his lap for intimate bonding time, he felt that he was being watched. <laughs> I could totally see this, but at the same time, it was super creepy. It was Edis in the doorway like a nosy housekeeper. Eyes glimmering like an angry tiger. After Rudy has shrieked in shock, Edis turned her eyes away and disappeared in the hallway shadows. She said nothing, but managed to be absolutely terrifying to him. <laughs> okay, he talked to her tomorrow. <laughs> Gonna see this little bonding moment, because I'm assuming they're in the bedroom, because it's only the two of them. I don't know why, technically, it doesn't make any sense that Roxy would look around the room if they were in a bedroom, but... Maybe in a, din a dining room or something like that. But yeah, just having this moment where he looks over and Edis is staring through the door. The next day, he found Edis training in the yard. Norn practicing beside her. This was odd, as Norn should be at school. I keep telling you, that's not right. Why aren't you getting it? That's not very helpful. What exactly am I doing wrong? What exactly? Uh... Edis was never good at putting these things to word. So, Reese was skeptical that Norn would learn anything from her. Some people with too much natural talent didn't understand all that they did instinctively. However... Well, you're not using your left hand enough. If you swing your sword using just your right arm, the blade is going to slip off his target. Try focusing on your movements on your left hand. Pretend that you're only using that arm. That should make the swings much cleaner. Wait, was this really Edis talking? <laughs> He's like, wait, <laughs> she knows how to talk to people and explain things. <laughs> Which, yes, again, was, what's Rudy's experience with, like, experienced swordsmen? It's like, okay, Rajard, who would be, his experience with Rajard would be, watching Roger train Edis. And in that whole situation, it was literally he clubbed her down and said, understand? And then she'd get back up. Club her down. Do you understand? <laughs> like, he wasn't, like, saying, do this, you know, or anything like that. Um, yes, technically with Paul. Paul was terrible at training him. Everybody pointed that out. Paul would be a terrible trainer. He's headstrong. He's immature. And he would just beat Rudius down. He wasn't explaining things to him. It was all natural to him. Gilang was... Possibly the same thing. I think he kind of explained that Gilang was a little bit better at explaining things. But still, she was mostly based off instincts. So it, it's it's that whole instincts versus logic. Which, yes, as they got better, Gilang eventually learned that. Going to the Sword Sanctum and, and learning it. Edis eventually learned that. Going to the Sword Sanctum and learning that. So it's kind of interesting to see that, yeah, that's, that's technically the assumption you have. All right, I think I get it now. Well, good. I'd hope so. Smiling at each other, they went back to their practice swings. Norn looked a little better than before. It made sense as she was a sword king now. Ghislaine told Rudius that you couldn't reach that rank on instincts or talent alone. Edis must have learned to think logically about her technique. In any case, Edis' swings were quick. He couldn't even see the blur past the very base of her blade. Her movements were beautiful. Her blade whispered slightly when she raised it and cut silently down. Only when it stopped could you hear a gentle whoosh. It was an entrancing sight. Watching her in action 
made him want to sigh in admiration. The total concentration in her face, the beads of sweat on her forehead, her taut, lean body, her muscles rippling with exertion. Oh man, how could he have overlooked this? Every time he swung her sword down, a certain springy part of her anatomy would quiver slightly. Not a swaying or bouncing, they were just jiggling a little. It's probably because her swings were so effective that her upper body wasn't moving much. She had some support from her shirt, but he had a feeling that she wasn't wearing chest armor underneath. Every swing had his eyes glued harder to this phenomenon. <laughs> it was a gravitational pull. <laughs> I like it so funny because like it's it's trying not to be like it's trying to be the trope of watching the girl, you know, work out and they're these are going like this. But because it's trying to emphasize how well she's trained, these shouldn't be doing this. If she is super well trained, this isn't moving. And so it's trying to point out this idea that I can see just barely, you can kind of see a little jiggle, <laughs> not too much because then it, and then she, because then she wouldn't be very well trained. It's like that struggle back and forth. Just like what he's doing with the muscles, so much muscles, but there's not muscles. She's not muscly. She's not a mass of muscles. It's so funny. Suddenly her chest stopped moving or rather she stopped swinging her sword. He noticed her staring right at him, legs spread shoulder width apart, chin in the air and a nasty frown. All she needed was to fold the arms to give the signature pose. Ruiz then noticed that she was holding the sword that she used in Orsted. He promptly chose to repeat. <laughs> he promptly chose to retreat. He didn't want to start an important conversation with somebody carrying a deadly weapon. It wasn't good manners. No, you're just afraid. Two hours later, he went to look for her again, assuming that her training was done. He noticed Norn's clothing at the bath entrance, but chose not to peep. Figuring Edis went out and about, he thought it would be best if he caught up with her out there because he doesn't have to have the conversation in the house. With this in mind, he went to the bathroom to relieve himself beforehand. As he reached for the doorknob, the door swung open from inside. Suddenly, he found himself inches from a startled-looking Edis. I totally, totally thought we were going to get... Do we... I don't think we've done it before. Maybe we have done it before. I totally thought we were going to have the open the, ba the bathroom door to somebody changing or something moment. Um, I think it, they did it before. At point-blank range... Her strong facial features were more strikingly beautiful. Her waves of hair, slightly damp, flown over her shoulders and down to her bust. Her sweat-drenched undershirt clung to her, offering a view of her cleavage. Her sweaty shirt revealed all lovely contours perfectly, down to the sharp summits. His eyeballs died and went to eyeball heaven. W what are you looking at? The uncertain look in Edith's face was extremely cute. Reflectively, I reached out and touched her chest, exploring the gentle slopes and peaks. They were angel-soft. A split second later, her shoulders blurred into motion, and he was knocked unconscious. Yeah, this is like a... a <laughs> it's so funny, this is kind of like a Rudeus L moment, like... This is like one of those kind of conflicting moments with Edis. Like, you know that Edis loves Rudeus, and so it's kind of okay for him to do that, but at the same time, it's like, it's not okay for him to do that. <laughs> like, you have two wives, and you're not in a relationship with Edis, and you're just gonna grab her. <laughs> Like, like some random woman, like uh, on the street, he's got two eyes at home. And he just grabs some random woman. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of like this thing that you understand. It's okay because you know that she's okay with it, but he doesn't know that. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a rough moment right there, but it's totally Rudeus and it's totally Rudeus X Edis moment. Like he's always been doing that with her, but yes, totally a Rudeus X Edis moment that she punched him, knocks him out. And he's lucky that it's an unlike usual Rudeus X at this moment that she actually lap pillows him. Coming to, he was resting on something firm. It was harder than his usual pillow, but it had a nice warmth, kind of supple. Also, someone was stroking his head. He realized it was a lap pillow. Pretending to be asleep, he mumbled about being unable to eat another bite. He buried his face in that triangular space where the pillow legs met the body. Then he took a nice deep breath while groping their backside. A shriek went off as he realized that it wasn't Sylphie's small palm-sized butt. He couldn't really smell Roxy's nice, comforting scent either. This was sweaty and setting off alarm bells in the back of his head. It wasn't half bad though. It made him feel nostalgic. Fully awake, he slowly opened his eyes to two shapely mountains and a pair of intense eyes glaring at him. Edis gripped his head firmly in her hand. Oh God, it's all over. <laughs> She's gonna twist my head off his neck. <laughs> Goodbye, Sylphie and Roxy. I'm, scar I'm sorry I'm leaving you so soon. But Edis didn't kill him. Instead, stroked his head with strong, gentle movements. I kind of felt like this is a missed opportunity right here to have like him open his eyes and have a brief moment that he sees the old Edis, just the same time, just the same as when he was nearly killed by Orsted and he wakes up in her, her lap. I think the anime could easily do it. That'd be really cool. 
studying her, she was pouting with her face red. Again, just the same as back then. She wouldn't look him in the eyes, but she didn't seem angry. Um, Miss Edis? It's just Edis. Okay, then. I'm sorry, Edis. When he apologized, her grip got more firm. He was done for again. <laughs> it's all right. I'm sorry, too. Oh, well, okay, then. I read your letter and everything. It wasn't easy for you after I left, right? He nodded. He wasn't adult enough to tell her that it wasn't her fault. The two of them badly misunderstood each other. He was hurt, and she was going through something similar. I hate this. this is one of those moments where it's like, I'm not grown. I'm not adult enough to tell her this, but inside my own head, I fully understand the situation. Like I am fully accepting everything that happened. I see the bigger picture, something I haven't seen for a long time. But I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> it's like, dude, you can say it. Um, uh, yeah. Hey, Rudius, what is it? She was silent for a moment, looking uncertain how to complete her sentence. They knew a lot had to be said, but couldn't find the words. It had been five long years apart. You do, um, love those two, don't you? Yeah, I love them both. Her grip tightened. <laughs> you like them more than me, right? Yeah. Her face crumpled in sadness. This is such a rough, <laughs> such a rough moment. It's, it should be true. By all accounts, that should be a true statement. But that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't help the situation at all. Yay! He wished he hadn't said that. He couldn't compare them. He loved Sylphie and Roxy very much, but he had fallen for Edis too. There was no point in denying that. Do you hate me now? Of course not. It's just, it's been a really long time since we saw each other. Sometimes I feel a little awkward around you, that's all. You know, I still like you a lot, Rudius. And I want you to love me back. Her face was as red as her hair. He was hearing it right. She confessed her love to him. Yes, there was no other way to interpret it. The question was how to reply. He knew his final answer, but before he could deliver it, he had to say something really stupid. <laughs> Before he, he had to say something stupid. He needed to make sure she understood what she was getting herself into. He does this like multiple times and, it, and it's like. The problem right here. And this is again. I kind of equate this to clueless protagonist Rudius. Like he, he act, he's acting like he's never talked to a woman before. He's going back there. He doesn't understand the order of operation. This is his problem. He's too busy trying to make sure this gets established first. Before I talk about this, it's like, you can do this and then qualify this. But what instead you're doing is you're, you're trying to take the wrong piece out of the tower and it all crumbles. You can put this in there first, then remove that and it won't crumble. That's your problem. Man, that's a good analogy. <laughs> the Jenga tower, you could put something in there before you pull the other one out. Do that first. Uh, anyways, you know, I have two wives already, right? See right there, it breaks the whole conversation. You're saying, I already have two wives. That's all she's going to hear. He doesn't understand that there's a qualifier you have to put in there first. She scowled and rose at her feet. Now, granted, granted, the letter already established all this. He said this. He said, I'll accept you. All that stuff. All she cares about right now, because she read that letter. She understands it. All she cares about right now is what that letter didn't say. The letter said, Edis, I'll accept your love. Right here, he's saying, I have two women already. She wants him to love her. She doesn't care about the two wives. She wants him to love her. She scowled and rose to her feet, ejecting him from her lap and bouncing his head on the floor. They were in the living room. Norn and Sylphie were at the house, but probably giving them space. On his hands and knees, Edis glared down at him, arms folded, Legs shoulder width apart and chin in the air. It was the same pose that she gave him the first time they met. Again, another callback they could do. There's so many callback moments in this chapter. They could easily do any of them in the anime. Step outside, Rudius. I want a duel. Uh, a, a, a duel? He clamored to his feet. That's right. If you win, I'll leave for good. But if I win, she paused before pointing her finger at his face. If I win, you then you have to love me too. Things just took a strange turn. All he could manage was to nod. And again, right here, it's as simple as saying, you don't have to duel that. I already love you. <laughs> like, it's, again, it's, it's it, yes, I understand that would be too easy and it wouldn't be entertaining. This is the, the problem that a lot of, like, anime in general and storytelling has, that it's, it's all about misunderstandings. That's what creates 50 chapters of 50 volumes. That's what creates that story is this one misunderstanding that they never talk about. You could stop it right here. I know it's, not, I know it's not as interesting. At least it doesn't get to exchanging blows. I was afraid of that with 
as I read on, I'm like, are we really going to do this? Like, you can easily fix the situation, Rudius. But yeah, that, that's, that's, that's chapter 10. Chapter 11, Edis Grey Rat, part two. That's like three full chapters of just Edis. This is different. This is, <laughs> this is different. It only took us 15 volumes before we got this many chapters of Edis. Rudius found himself facing off against Edis outside the city walls. No crowd to witness it. But... Geelang was dragged out there by Edis. She'd serve as a referee, so maybe that meant that she wasn't going to kill him. Edis wasn't saying anything at all, just watching him with her hand on her hilt. He noticed that her hands were trembling slightly, but it may be from the excitement. That was interesting because he has it kind of alludes to that later in the idea of would she have thrown the fight? And that, oh, that hurts. <laughs> that really does hurt. The thought process that there's a possibility that where she's at right now, staying there, she's thinking if he goes through with this, the possibility this is what Rudius thinks that could have been going on in her head. What if she was thinking, if he does lift his staff, I'll lose and walk away. Because what she's created in this situation, this duel, what she has created is fire at me. And that means you want me to go away. That's your answer. She's essentially forcing him to give her an answer. <laughs> Again, she came here knowing that he'd accept her. And then he has wives. She knows this stuff already. And he keeps repeating it. She knows this already. She was struggling with it the whole trip there. Hurting from the, the whole trip there. She just wants him to love her. So she's basically forcing him to say, love me or go away. She's forcing this to be a simple A, B. All it takes, one lift of his staff. I have my answer. So yeah, her trembling here, I think, is her going, please don't fire. Like, please don't raise your staff. Please don't. What was he supposed to do? Fight seriously? He was okay with losing. It was actually preferable. He'd fallen for her. Sure, he said that he liked Silphy and Roxy more, but that was reflexive. He couldn't actually rank his feelings. Silphy, Roxy, and Edis were all wonderful, lovable women in their own ways. Honestly, a part of him was drooling at the idea of hopping into bed with this new sexy version of Edis. He was happy to oblige her desire for love. It wasn't like he would be cheating at this point. He did love her, and there was nothing wrong with it, damn it. What was wrong with making such an attractive woman yours? Come at me, Mills Church fools. I'll marry as many as I want. <laughs> such an... He's so unfaithful. <laughs> Still, how would Edis react to a forfeit? Would it be insulting? Would she see him as a coward? She became a master swordswoman to protect him from Orsted. Maybe he needed to demonstrate his strength and how well he improved. That would have been a massive, massive mistake. I don't know. I, I think at this range, and he kind of admits it himself, at this range, he couldn't. I don't think he could fight her and beat her. Maybe if he had his armor and stuff like that, but at this range, she'd be on him an instant. But again, I don't think she would even choose to raise her sword. He hadn't trained nearly as hard as she had, but that wasn't the point. She probably wanted him to take it seriously. If he lost, that'd be fine. If he won, he could say, all right, you're mine now. Come on, we're going home. The problem is, his magic armor was still laying in pieces in the forest. Edis was a sword king who put in a solid effort against Orsid in melee. Roos couldn't see how he could beat her unless he was miles away. Whatever. It was fine if he lost. As he reached that conclusion, Ghislaine called out to him. He hadn't seen Ghislaine in a while, but she hadn't changed much. Apart from getting further into middle age, they exchanged pleasantries and had a few conversations upon their arrival in the city. But she hadn't gone into detail about the situation with Edis. That wasn't strange as they were never intimate with each other. She taught you how to do beast tongue. What the heck, man? <laughs> Miss Edis hasn't changed much at all. You need to show her how you feel. Her voice was calm, but firm, like he remembered. But the implications of her words made him hesitate. Was fighting Edis really the right move? Looking to Edis, she had her usual pose and was waiting for him to prepare. But as familiar as her pose was, she looked very different now. Taller, figure more developed, but she had the bearing of a sleek, deadly predator. Five years had passed. And while he had changed too, Ghislaine seemed to think that Edis hadn't. That's interesting. That is very, very interesting statement. Again, sort of pushing this idea that despite the fact that Rius keeps saying that she's not who she was, and I don't think she is, Ghislaine still sees that deep down, Edis hasn't changed. Ghislaine sort of gave the hint that she seen that Edis had changed back when they were leaving the Sword Sanctum. Like, obviously, her being around Isolde and Anina, all of them had changed her. She has changed. But I think what Ghislaine would be implying here, if, if it's true... Ghislaine would be implying the idea that deep down romantically, she hasn't changed. She's still madly in love with you. How did he respond to her tantrums back then? How should he respond to this one? Ghislaine shouted out to start the duel, but Rudius didn't raise his staff. 
Edis too just stood there with folded arms. After a while, she drew her sword and began walking slowly to him, letting the sword dangle loosely at her side. It was the same sword that she used in Orsid, apparently one of the famous seven sword god blades, something Galfalion gave her. She stopped before Rudius, raised her sword, and fixed a glare at him. What? Aren't you going to fight? You're going to leave if I win, right? Well, I'd rather lose then. She frowned. I mean, I sort of missed my chance to say it earlier, but I do love you, Edis. Her reaction made Rudius think of a bristling cat. <laughs> Crap, did I piss her off again? <laughs> Should I have taken it serious after all? Edis swung her blade downwards. Flinching reflectively, he closed his eyes, only to feel a small jolt on the top of his head. Edis had tapped him with the hilt of her sword. Opening his eyes, her face was inches from his. I can't cook like Sylphie does. Yeah, I know. I'm not smart like Roxy. I know. I'm not cute like they are. You're a beautiful badass, so it doesn't really matter. But you prefer, um, more petite girls, right? Okay, that's not true at all. I'm very attracted to you. She returned her sword to its sheath and slowly but nervously wrapped her arms around his waist. She was squeezing him tightly, chest against his. Her mildly sweaty smell hadn't changed a bit. Returning her embrace, her muscles were more developed than before. They weren't exactly bulky either. Hugging her felt good. Felt right. So cute. <laughs> Let me stop here. I love that. I love that idea of like him closing his eyes and the bunk. <laughs> it's so cute. Um, again, it's one of those things of like back here he could have solved this issue, but obviously going through this whole thing is a lot more cuter and it's a lot more to the credit of Edis. It is that idea of like despite the fact that we think we can write something better, having the characters be more clear about their 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 statements, not it missing those qualifiers that could avoid misunderstandings uh, leads to be more boring than something like this that kind of plays out a character a lot better. I mean, it's just like back there with him going off to Orsted. He could have waited for Edis and things would have been a lot different, but he didn't. It turned out to be a lot more interesting. You're okay with calling this my win then? Yeah. You know, Rudius, if you really don't want me, I'll give up on you. Her voice trembled. Somehow he got the feeling that she would have lost on purpose if he fought for real. Again, I sort of follow that logic. I sort of think that's true. The idea that she was just looking to see if he would actually fire, which would basically be him finally saying, no, I don't want you. Then it kind of turns that whole thing of like, would she leave him? And then it goes in the whole thing about the future diary and how all that kind of played out and how that he rejected her and then she just followed him around. But I think that's probably because with this future, if, if he were to raise his staff and she left, with this future, it's her understanding what he has gained, what she lost what she did to him and understanding that it was my fault in a way. And now I understand that he's happy and I'll leave him be. I think she'd still be there and watch him from a distance. And even with the whole aspect of future Rudius's diary, a lot of that I think is her trying to push him back into the straight and narrow, trying to fix his path because he goes down this dark place. Whereas here, I think she's more happy with where he's at. Her loving him and wanting him to be happy and in a good place Whereas in that future, he wasn't. But it'd be hard to really say that she'd be able to leave him for good. That won't be necessary. You'll make me part of your family then? Yeah. As long as you're okay with sharing me with Roxy and Sylphie sometimes. Here I have to here I have to say, like, this was a grand opportunity. Again, this kind of goes in my my mindset of really trying to constantly think of references back from their first time together. And I'm like, the perfect response to you'll make me part of your family then would be. We're already a family. Do you remember back at the refugee camp? You wanted us to be family. I accepted it back then, and I'm accepting it now. But no. He says, oh, if you're okay with Sylphie and Roxy, he kind of keeps qualifying it and breaking the conversation. She knows this already. <laughs> but again, I guess it's a good thing to constantly make sure that it's understood. He paused. Those words probably sounded cheap coming from him, but he needed to say it. For the third freaking time, I want you to marry me, Edis. Her eyes widened and eyelashes trembled. Her mouth fell open a little, but then she regained her composure. She tossed her head haughtily to the side. <laughs> well, if you insist, I guess I'll let you. <laughs> True, Edis, great right moment. She's back. And with that, Edis became his wife. The truth, the Sundede comes back. At dinner, Rudius officially announced the marriage. Unlike with Roxy, he laid the groundwork beforehand, so it wasn't an explosion to deal with. He still expected something from Norn, but maybe she had given up returning him to the straight and narrow. <laughs> Roxy and Sylphie gave their congratulations. Welcome to the family, Edis. Don't worry, we can work out the ground rules a little later. Thank you for having me. She looked awkward as ever. It was rare to see Edis nervous about anything, but he could tell she was genuine and wanted to win their approval. This was a positive sign, as he really was hoping they'd get along. After dinner, the three of them would take a bath together. They would lecture her 
on the proper way to use the facilities. Like they have to explain that whole situation. That 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 over there is a, a black box that nobody understands. Plus, they would have some bonding time in the bath. He was dying to tag along, but managed to restrain himself. After his wife's left, Rudis was left with Lilia, Zenith, his sisters, and Ghislaine. Zenith, <laughs> Zenith began punching. Damn it! it it's supposed to be funny, and it still hurts me. <laughs> Zenith began punching him. Zenith began silently punching him on the head. Lilia murmured, Miss, I think you've made your point. But there was no signs of the onslaught stopping. Zenith was a devout member of the Mills Church. She tolerated him taking a second wife, but seemed extremely displeased at a third. I don't know. I don't know. There's a side of me that believes the only reason that Roxy, the whole situation with Roxy joining worked is because Zenith wasn't quite recovered enough then. It's obviously showing that over time, Zenith is recovering more and more. She's becoming more animated. She's becoming more responsive to things. So I think there is an aspect that back then she wasn't as responsive to respond to it. And I think a lot of that, like I've said early on in this whole ordeal with Zenith, is that I think there's an aspect of like what I've dealt with several times over is this idea of you, you feel like they're in there somewhere. They just can't communicate. So you're standing in front of them and you say, you know, I love you. And they're just blank because deep down in there, they're, they're trying to say, say something, tell them, yes, I, I love you too. Say something, mouth move. And so I can see again, depending on how, I guess what Refugian's, what Refugian is doing with Zenith, what actual disease or effect affliction is happening is it just a magic is bottling it in there is it you know a dementia is it a reverse dementia is it something that recovers over time is the is the points in the brain learning how to refire again like it's been damaged by some sort of um breaking of those connections and they have to reconnect them what is his plans here so i can see it being an aspect of she just can't communicate that she's displeased by it back there, but now she can. Or yes, is it an idea that she's like, well, Paul did that. So I can't blame him too much. And Rius helped me deal with that situation with Lilia joining the family. So I'm gonna allow him to do it. I can see why he would do this. I can see him being just like his father. But then the third one happens. It could be, okay, you're going too far, son. Stop. Stop doing this. You're doing this too much. You're getting worse. Stop. Focus on your wives you already have. Stop bringing new ones in. Either way, it hurts still. <laughs> Either way, it hurts still. Again, getting some response out of her and it being a negative one does hurt. <laughs> ow, ow, that hurts. Mom, I'm sorry, okay? I won't do it again. Zenith pulled back her fist and returned to her chair. His sisters, who were sitting next to her, were now looking at him reproachfully. <laughs> She's like, it's our turn. I like how we go through this. It's like everybody's taking their turns. <laughs> my turn, my turn, my turn. <laughs> Aisha spoke up. Isn't that what you said when you brought Roxy home, dear brother? Your word clearly isn't worth that much. Sigh, I expect that you'd be dragging another girl back with you soon enough. Oh, there's gonna be so much laundry to do. <laughs> he couldn't say anything to that. This decision had clearly lost him a few affection points from them, but that was something that he could live with. Aisha did have legitimate complaints, but her voice was flat. She was probably just giving him a hard time. Yeah, now she's upset. Rudius, Norn then spoke up, voice seemingly earnest. He had to take it seriously. Yes, Norn, what can I do for you? Um... As a member of the Mills Church, I can't really approve of your behavior. Understandable. That said, I could tell how much Miss Edis loves you, so I'm not going to object this time. But she couldn't see it in Roxy. <laughs> but again, I think that was because back then, Norm was already dealing with the fact that she lost her father. The man she always looked to. This pillar in her life. Her only pillar in her life. She lost that. And I think that was partly that build up inside of her. That anxiety that frustration, that pain, then this this happens. So she couldn't even bother at that time, possibly, to even see that Roxy loved him. Plus, I even think that Rudius at the time acknowledged that he's essentially saying, hey, got another wife in the midst of mourning. You might not be that fond of her yet, but I expect that you give her plenty of affection anyways. That's all I had to say. I understand. I promise to do my very best in that regard. Norn seemed to like Edis quite a bit. From what he had heard, she was the one that asked her to do sword lessons. Norn seemed to have gotten a lot more outgoing over the last few years. Maybe they had something to do with her work with the student council. Either way, it was a good thing. Master Rudius. It was Lilia's turn. Her voice a little quieter than usual. 
<laughs> Each for everybody take a turn. Yes, Lilia. Now that you've added Miss Edis to the family, this house will be getting somewhat cramped. I'm willing to rent a room nearby and live there with Miss Zenith in order to... Nope. Not happening. Look, I want to take care of you two. Er, well, you're the one that's looking after me, really. But you know what I mean. I can't say that I agree with that assessment, Master Rudius, but I'll accept your wishes in that matter. She's like constantly just looking for a reason to leave. <laughs> it's like you, your house is crap, Rudius. You're... you're <laughs> you're just bringing women home left and right. Um, I, I just want to make sure that I'm out of the way so that if you bring another woman, you have a room. <laughs> if he kicked his mothers out just because he had too many wives, his old man would turn into a vengeful spirit. A good kid takes care of his parents when they're older. Indeed, they ran out of guest rooms, but that wasn't a major problem. They'd figure something out if they had to. Yeah, plus Roxy would probably be fine with living in a closet. <laughs> She's like, I like cramped spaces. It's a side effect of the labyrinth. <laughs> now Ghislaine spoke up. Radius. <laughs> Yes, Miss Ghislaine. Just Ghislaine, kid. I can leave the little miss in your hands, right? Yes, I'll take good care of her, I swear. She smiled a little. Oh yeah? You've doing some growing up, I see. You've got the same look that Paul had in his eyes when he decided to marry Zenith. Was that supposed to be a compliment? <laughs> well, he'd take it as one. So, he took after his father in those days, huh? Nice to hear. Maybe he had grown a bit more mature. But Ghislaine only knew Paul in the old days. Back when he was a scumbag? <laughs> How was that a compliment? <laughs> I thought the same thing. I'm like, yeah, technically, that... that it's not a good thing. What are you planning to do next, Ghislaine? Any thought about settling down in the city? No. Now that I've entrusted Miss Edis to you, my job here is done. I think I'll head back down to Asra. Asra? Were you planning on helping out rebuild the Fatoa region or something? Ghislaine's eyes flashed with emotion. I didn't like this. <laughs> I didn't like this at all. <laughs> not exactly. I'm going to find out whoever got Lord Saros executed, and I'm going to kill them. That's no bueno. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> it felt like the temperature in the room had suddenly dropped significantly. The ominous answer blindsided him. He could understand what she was coming from. Until now, she was solely focused on taking care of Edis. Now that the little miss was safely with him, her job was complete. Now, all she had left was to take revenge for whoever brought down the man that she served loyally. That means you don't know who they are yet, right? It sounds like his death was part of a complicated web of intrigue. So I guess lots of people had a hand in it. I'll just cut down all of Boris's family's old enemies one by one. Simple enough. It seemed too simple. Classic Elaine. How was he going to stop her though? At this rate, she was going to charge into the capital of a kingdom and get herself killed. Unfortunately, it felt like nothing that he would say would change her mind. This was Ghislaine after all. In that case, it was best to find a better way for her to do it. That was my mindset because I'm already thinking like, yes, technically everything that happened in the future diary. Everything that happened in that, that scenario, it's not good. Again, we already know who's going down there. I mean, they were leaving the Sword Sanctum with them, so we know they're going to be there. He then remembered his diary. When Ariel launched the coup on Asra, the Water God and the North Emperor had defeated her. Ghislaine, there's something you should know. I've heard from a pretty reliable source that the Kingdom of Asra currently has both a Water God and a North Emperor working for them. Ah, those two. Are you already acquainted? Yeah. I know them well. So does Miss Edis, for that matter. What about it? Well, you might end up facing off against them. I know how strong you are, but I don't think you can come out of that alive. True enough, I couldn't handle both of them alone. She nodded and fell silent, as if waiting to hear if he had something else to say about it. For what it's worth, I know one person who got caught up in the same mess that cost Lord Saros his life. It's possible that she was working against the Boris family at the time, so you might consider her an enemy. But if you join forces with her, I think you might get a chance to kill the people that you want dead, and a legitimate justification for doing so. Who is it? Ariel Anamoy Asura. Her twitching ears sent a jolt of nostalgia through his system. She always did that whenever she had a problem that she couldn't figure out when he was tutoring her. In that case, if she didn't recognize the name, so much the better. She's the second princess of the Kingdom of Asura. Is that so? He paused, wondering if this is the right move. Ariel was likely to start a reckless coup in the near future. Was he sending her off to her death? No. The future can be changed. Having read the diary, he could offer Ariel general advice. They could turn that reckless coup into a success. It was possible the man-god would be pulling strings behind those events. Since he was Orsa's subordinate now, his involvement might change things. Assuming he ended up finding a way for Ariel to emerge triumphant, it would be better for them all to have Ghislaine at her side. Rius had every intention of helping out personally, but he needed to consult Orsid first. Yeah, that's interesting because that that there's a lot of different threads here. And yes, technically, I assume at some point, Rudius is going to have to deal with that. It's like, this is this thing that's been sitting here for a while, and it feels like it's building up. Like, all accounts, things are building up here. My argument is, yeah, technically, they all assume that this is happening. Like, there's going to be a shoot for the throne. That's why they're bringing those individuals there. That's why that all kind of played the way it did. But... What part, how much involvement is he really going to have is a big massive question mark. And yeah, with Ghislaine now involved with it, it kind of, 
hurts even more. Yeah, technically, I still like Ariel, <laughs> but that's her deal. That's what she wants to get involved with. That's her that's her business. But um, yeah, the the involvement with Orsted himself is the question mark. How much is he? Why should he consult with Orsted? And yes, technically, now that he is serving Orsted, he can't just do his own thing because Orsted might need him in the midst of it. I think you should at least have a conversation with her to see what you think. All right. If you say so, I will. Whoa. Aisha and Norm were staring, eyes wide open. Can I help you guys? Um, you really were a tutor of the Sword King, huh? What? Did you think I made that up? I mean, not really. I just wasn't expecting Miss Ghislaine to take your advice so seriously. Puzzled, Rudius and Ghislaine exchanged glances. <laughs> Was that conversation strange? Um, Rudius, Norm interjected. I know this older student at the university who wants to become an adventurer, and they were telling me the other day about how this really scary Sword King had come to town. Even the toughest people in the city are a little intimidated by her, you know? It's kind of impressive to see you talk to her as an equal. Ghislaine grinned. <laughs> Rhys is a hell of a lot scarier than I will ever be, kid. I mean, he won the respect of the Dragon God. Wow! Norrin looked genuinely impressed. Maybe he regained a few of those affectionate points. <laughs> Maybe just respect points. He couldn't see her opinion of his love life changing. Uh, that, yeah, that is kind of interesting. I, I would assume that he informed Norrin what happened that whole situation. He said that he went around to all of his family and friends and told everybody what happened. Um, but I think probably what was missing there, Ghislaine, and this is really cool. I like this little kind of, now that I've read the next chapter, I kind of see this now. Ghislaine, I think, seen that Orsted had some genuine respect for what Ruiz did there. As we see in the next chapter, it kind of points out this idea that he, he worked Orsted. Like, besides Rudius thinking that he basically got his face smashed in the mud, he technically did do something. And I think Ghislaine seen that. Ghislaine seen the exchange as the Dragon God gain amount of respect for Rius because, yeah, you can argue, Orsted didn't kill him. He let him live. As a respect there, you fought really well. I'm gonna let you live. That night, Ghislaine left to their inn. Edis joined Silphy and Roxy in a private conversation, and Rudius was left curious of the discussion. He avoided listening in, but the mood seemed friendly enough. Edis was just listening to the two intently. That girl had come a long way from her wilder childhood years. Rudius ended up tutoring Norn in a study. Once she turned in for the night, he added entry to his diary. It was definitely a day worth commemorating. When his thoughts turned to the future of his family and his role under Orsted, he did feel a little anxious, but they made it through a turbulent storm together. That was worth celebrating. As he left his study, the house was silent. His wives must have gone to bed, or maybe were waiting for him. No, not likely. When the house was silent like this, it could be a little unsettling. His future self visited on a quiet night like this. Would he get another dramatic surprise? Maybe a creepy little guy with his whole body hidden in a blurry mess of pixels would come popping out of the shadows. Okay, he was being a little ridiculous. <laughs> this is one of those moments where as I'm reading, I'm going, yeah, you're, you're making me a little nervous, Rudy. It's like him pointing out how quiet it is and how it's eerie and everything is making me nervous. Like what is going on here? He made his way to the bedroom. Assuming no one was in there because there was no light in there. He reached for the doorknob and the door swung open and he was dragged inside violently. Rius reflectively threw his hands out to his assailant and began to channel mana. But they grabbed his wrists and pressed it back against the door, pinning him in place. For a second, he thought he was done for. But then he noted who he was up against. Oh, it, it's you, Edis. His new wife, in a casual nightgown, apparently ambushed him. <laughs> um, Rudius, her eyes were extremely bloodshot, <laughs> face flushed and breathing roughly. She looked absolutely furious. Did he piss her off? We're we're man and wife now, right? Officially? Well, yeah. Oh, did you want to have a formal ceremony or something? We could call a bunch of people in and... Uh, no, I don't even remember how to dance anymore. Look, that's not what I'm talking about. I want to do it. <laughs> I thought for a minute because she was like breathing heavy and everything and her eyes were bloodshot. There was a thought that, that maybe, I don't know, Rudy... Refugian likes to do this where, like, he stops talking about something, and then out of nowhere, it happened. Like, Rudius keeps thinking, like, I could sell this scroll, like, this, this lamplight scroll, I can sell it to the guild. And then out of nowhere, I've been making money from the lamplight scroll, and I was like, okay, I guess he did that. This could be one of the situations, like, yeah, by the way, uh, Aisha figured out how to turn the, the stuff from the horny Groot into an aphrodisiac, and now we're selling aphrodisiacs. And oh, yeah, by the way, Edis took one. Because, it, like, the, the bloodshot part... <laughs> Kind of threw me off a bit there, but she's just thirsty. She's mad thirsty. She's probably been waiting in the bedroom the whole time, waiting for him to come in there, doing like crouches or something like that, doing doing push ups or something like that. And then Rius is usual clueless protagonist stuff. Like he's super clueless protagonist, protagonist about this whole. Like I don't know. There's something about Edis that brings out the cluelessness in Rudius. It's just frustrating. He thought to himself, "Do what exactly?"
It's, it's literally the first night together with Ed is all over again. Family? What does she mean? Give him a family. What? That's weird. What does she want to do? I don't know. What was she's on top of me? What? What's going on? Is she want to wrestle? All right, let's play some Twister. It is so. It's so dumb. Before he could give him much thought. Ed is threw her arms around his shoulders and pulled him in for a violent kiss. Her teeth slammed against his, giving him a jolt of pain. Oh, I hate that. I really do. I don't like that. Ugh, I can just feel it. He tried to pull away, but the door behind him made it impossible. Ed has kept grinding her forehead against him enthusiastically. As he finally came up for air, Ed has dragged him over the bed. Wait, what the heck was even going on here? Holy crap. We're moving way too fast. Uh, Edis, uh, I think we should slow down a little bit. You know, we should talk things through with Sylvie and Roxy first. I did that already. Sylvie said it was my turn. What about Roxy? She might want us to wait while she's pregnant. She was fine with it, actually. <laughs> she's like, I checked with everybody already. It's like Rudius, who's like always thirsty. Suddenly he's like, whoa, I'm a, I'm a protagonist. I'm an Edis, he's that guy. Edis threw him onto the bed and was holding him down with so much force that he couldn't squirm free, even if he tried. Hey, I want our first kid to be a boy, okay? She was still breathing roughly through her nose. She wasn't angry. She was horny. He had to admit, he hadn't expected quite this level of enthusiasm from her. He wasn't complaining. It was charming to see how much she wanted him. And his body wasn't exactly objecting to her advances either. But wasn't he the one that was supposed to be doing the ravishing? <laughs> it's like, yes. First encounter with Edis was Clueless Protagonist's top. Second encounter with Edis is Clueless Protagonist's bottom. <laughs> Rudius is time to learn how to be the bottom. <laughs> You have two girls already, two wives already that are bottoms, and now you have a top. I love you, Rudius. You wouldn't turn me down, right? Well, uh, of course not. Try to calm down a little, though. Why don't we take a short time to set the mood first? We can have a few drinks, catch up on the last five years, and get started once things feel nice and romantic. It's literally like, it's literally like Rudius is being with the other girl. He even points it out, I think, later on. It's like, they have like, I wonder if this is how they feel. Like, how he's like, just, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And they probably want to talk. Again, <laughs> Rudius just got a husband. <laughs> Rudius just married a Rudius. Ah, screw that. Do you know how long I've been waiting to do this again? Again, back when Edis parted ways with Rudius, she mentioned the idea that because she's a Boris Grey Rat, she has that sensation in her. Like she's going to be craving him this whole time. She wasn't sure how he would feel, but she was from that point on always going to be craving him again. She climbed on the bed and positioned herself on top of Rudius. Her powerful legs clamped him in place. Her hands pressed his against the bed. She leaned in and pushed her nose against his upper chest sniffing loudly. Was she a dog? Hopefully he wasn't smelly that night. Rudius, we're married now, right? That means you're all mine, right? Huh? Uh, I mean, not exactly. I was hoping that you'd share me with the other two, actually. Again, shut up. You don't have to talk. You don't have to mention that right now. Let's all just get along. Uh, but it's my turn tonight, so you're mine right now. It seemed like there was only one answer that would satisfy her. Well, yes. Her grip grew stronger. He feared she'd break them off, and he'd have to ask Orsid for another favor. <laughs> that means I could do anything I want, right? He wasn't sure what she was planning on doing, or what would become of himself, but it clearly involved sex. He wouldn't oppose that. Sh sure, I guess. As soon as he spoke those words, Edis turned into a beast. <laughs> I can just see this like, like, like a jaguar noise or something like that in the background. It goes dark. <laughs> Reese woke up to Sparrow's chirping. <laughs> he immediately looked for Edis, whose striking face was right next to him. The woman was beautiful in her sleep. I like that note. And he kind of mentioned that again. He let out a small sigh of relief. It is so funny that even till now, that fear is in his head. This is something, again, when he first spent that first night with her, she disappeared the next morning. And it and it made him, it, it messed him up bad. Was I, was I terrible in bed? Does she think I'm terrible? Did she leave me? Am I not good enough for her? Did she break up with me? Does she hate me? And again, that turns that whole ED thing and that turns that whole fear of performance, not being good in bed. Um, will the woman leave me the next morning? That all builds up that whole moment where he gets, you know, the Luke juice involved, Sylphie gets involved, Ariel gets involved, they, they get they get the fix going on. Um, then again, the next morning, she, Sylphie's there, and that repairs that. It doesn't seem like he ever mentions that ever again. Like, even with Roxy, he doesn't mention it ever again. Because it's Edis again, suddenly, crap, is, is this going to happen again? Is she gonna Is she going to be gone? So it's kind of interesting to see that he actually recalls back that. It does make you wonder if she did disappear, would it break him again? <laughs> we'd have to get we'd have to get that group working quick. They enjoyed themselves to great lengths, especially Edis. It was safe to say that his techniques were superior to hers. He was in the lead, early at least. He didn't want her to get the best of him. So he gave everything he had. Sadly, things turned around mid-game. The woman just had more stamina. Much like their first time, she just kept going. Long story short, he didn't win. <laughs>
Edis ended up enjoying herself for quite a while while he lay there limp and unresisting. <laughs> he had never been so thoroughly dominated in his life. Despite his defeat, seeing Edis sitting next to him with a content expression filled him with warm feelings. She was like a raging wolf, but now borderline angelic. It put a smirk on his face. Maybe this is how Sylphie felt whenever she would watch him sleeping. Hmm, this sure feels different though. His head was resting on Edis' arm. <laughs> Again, he got a husband. Until now, he was always on the receiving end of this position. <laughs> it was weirdly refreshing. His pillow was on the slender side, but it was solid for some reason. It made him feel safe. <laughs> He's got a husband. <laughs> she, had, she had gotten muscular over the five years. It was dark the night before, but what he had seen was enticing. Squirming around a little bit, he touched Edis' belly. Oh, how splendid. On the surface, there wasn't much in a way of clearly defined abs. In fact, she had a decent amount of fat on her, but underneath it was a layer of remarkably dense muscle. Pushing his fingers against her skin, a compact six pack revealed itself. Again, it, it kind of it keeps correcting it like she's got all these muscles, but there's, you can't see them and you can't touch them. She's nice and, but she's got muscles. <laughs> you can't, the refugee can't decide if she wants her muscular or not. It's, it's balance. In the end, it's, Balance, perfect balance, is what Refugian is basically saying. It was a wonder how it was possible to have a body like this without getting all bulky. A miracle her waist was so slender. She must have trained all of her obliques and hip muscles in balance. He wondered what it was about muscles on a woman that made him sexy. He didn't want to take his hands off of them, but he did have another target. He slowly moved upwards. <laughs> he slowly, slowly moved his hands upwards to the two great mounds. He spent most of his previous night with his hands trapped in a vice grip. So he hadn't got many chances to touch them. They had a solid foundation. She had pecs, but they were just as firm and compact as her abs. On top of those solid plates, dessert was placed. Touching them, they were huge like melons. Sylphie and Roxy didn't have anything like them. He liked theirs just fine, but the bigger ones had their own special charm. And from now on, he could touch them whenever he wanted to. He owed a great few words of gratitude to God. Thank you, Roxy. Thank you, Sylphie. His great quest had come to an end. He scaled the Edis Mountain, and a new day had dawned for mankind. <laughs> The familiar white-haired old man appeared in his mind's eye. Well, if it isn't the wise old hermit, long time no see, buddy. Take a look at these fresh, glorious fruits. Ho, ho, ho. It seems I have nothing left to teach you, young one. May your road lead to enlightenment. What? No, come back. Wise old hermit, come back. I, have, <laughs> still, have need, I still have great need of your wisdom. <laughs> He's like, you're done. You got it all. Congratulations. You achieved all that. Suddenly, he made eye contact with Edis. She woke up at this point. Is this the part where he got punched? Before he could say anything, Edis whipped her hands over and grabbed his wrist. She did, in fact, look a little upset. Let's talk about this, honey. More chatting, less punching. How about some mice pill talk? Remember that time when we started doing sit-ups together? Back when we were kids? And I couldn't help but reach over and grab your abs? Ah, what a little rascal I was. Spitting on top of him, she tangled her limbs around his. It wasn't anger in her eyes. It was lust. He must have set her off again. <laughs> Just kind of rather the engine. <laughs> it made sense. He'd be fired up if someone was playing with his body, but he figured women viewed this situation less favorable than men. But Edis was an exception. Fine then, he'd take her on and teach her a lesson this time. <laughs> well, wait, gently, gently, could you slow down a little, honey? <laughs> we just, we just spent all night, eek! As he squeaked like a bashful schoolgirl, Edis ravaged him for a second time. Like, he can't beat her. <laughs> oh, gosh. Finally getting up for good <laughs> that afternoon. He was alone, and Edis was nowhere to be seen. He didn't feel anxious or abandoned, just drained and content. Looking out the window, he spotted Edis doing her usual practice swings with a smirk on her face. She's like, yes, yes, yes. Despite all that exercise last night, she still had energy. He wasn't complaining. Sylphie and Roxy didn't have much staying power as him. This was the first time he really got squeezed dry like that. This, this is the interesting point, because I remember back when... um. Yeah, back when the, the season one or the season two of uh, Mashoko Tensei aired and they had the whole moment where Rudeus beds Sylphie. And all these memes were popping up with Rudeus all drained sitting on the bed and, and Sylphie was on the side going, ha ha ha. Like, and it's like, no, like all all signs point to Rudeus like dominating Sylphie. I don't know why there's like his intention that she drained him, that like wore him out. Um, technically, yes, when he took the aphrodisiac, it kind of overdrive him to the point where he just wore himself out. But yeah, they've always kind of implied this idea that Sylphie and Roxy can't keep up with him. This is the first time. Like, Edis is the one that that he can't keep up with. Like, this is a complete shift in the dynamic for him. He can't, he can't dominate her. He can't win her. It kind of is turning into a game. Like, with Edis, it's a game. Like, I, I gotta take her on. Um, he kind of mentions it's each one of them. You know, Sylphie being much more um, submissive, 
Roxy being the technician, which he's kind of mentioned before, this idea that he, she's always trying different things. She's always wanting to study and figure things out and trying to work together on things. <laughs> and Edis is just a lot of aggression. He can't, he can't keep up with her. She's got too much stamina. She's breaking him. She, she can use, <laughs> Edis is the first one that can use a battle aura. <laughs> And she probably uses that battle aura against him. It makes you wonder if that is a thing in the world, like using battle aura to, um, yeah, for performance in bed. It's gotta be. It's gotta be a thing. I just think I think it just opened up a whole massive can of worms of uh, of uh, side story content with that one. Dojinchis and and fanfics. After it all, he really did want to have some pillow talk next time around. He was really looking forward to spending a nice lazy hour in bed with Edis this morning. He wanted to hear about how she spent the last five years of her life and about all the people that she met along the way. Again, it's kind of funny having that reverse effect where he's like, yeah, I kind of wish that I had the same thing there. <laughs> it's like, yes, he's turned into the wife. For the time, he headed to the bath to clean himself off. Once that was done, he made a prayer at his altar. It felt like it was time to add a third idol to the shrine. The God of Wisdom and Love was joined by the God of War. Maybe a wooden sword would be appropriate. Pondering this, he wandered to the living room where Aisha was cleaning the floor. She popped up at the sight of him. Good morning, brother dear. You got a letter. It doesn't say who it's from, but there's a kind of symbol on the envelope. Do you recognize it? When he looked at the letter, he froze up. He was very familiar with the crest on the envelope. It was the emblem of the dragon god. <laughs> and that is chapter 11. Edis in the chat. We have... We have brought a new husband into the family. Rudius has lost the pants. <laughs> Rudius has lost the pants to Edis. She had taken over. She's dominating. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily that Rudius gained a wife. It's more that Edis gained a wife and two sisters. <laughs> that, that's how I see it, is that Edis gained two sisters and a wife. <laughs> Not so much that Rudius gained a wife. Uh, it's good stuff. It is good stuff. But yeah. Really, really great set of two chapters. It's it's really, God, honestly, just nine volumes of weight. Like for anybody that has an appreciation for Edis, I know there's a lot of people that there's people that are not gonna like Edis. There's people that don't like Roxy. There's people that don't like Sylphie. People don't like certain characters. I, I understand that. Um, I get that. But for those of us that sort of at least can be empathetic to Edis as a character, that she was a young teenager like she was very young <laughs> and she made this decision back here not knowing about romance i mean that it's, it's not as if edis growing up in this this noble family being spoiled being basically thrown to a, a sword trainer to be an adventurer being discarded from the family itself like she even acknowledged that herself this 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 country didn't want me they were gonna get rid of me being displaced basically fighting to get stronger and surviving this long, dirty home. This is a kid. This is a kid that doesn't have a textbook on romance. This is a kid that hasn't read 50 novels to figure out how to be in love. This is a kid that has never experienced love herself, suddenly making a bad decision. And unfortunately, this is something that Rudius, who she's not aware of, has a previous life of being a neat and feeling that people will betray him. She has no knowledge that that would break him. If she did, she wouldn't have done it. That aside, for those that are empathetic to her and her struggle to get stronger and her desire to be equal with him in order to stand at his side and spending five straight years training her body to get stronger only to discover that she in the end will not be able to. And the only thing that she can afford Rudius in the end would be to keep Orsted busy while Rudius does the job. This has been nine volumes of waiting for that moment that Edis will finally, finally come to Rudius again, finally be at his side again. And it, there, it, it, is, it is a massively rewarding thing because if you think about it, yes, technically, Edis is his first love. In this world, Edis is his first love. Yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of it that is Roxy and the idea that he you know he was lustful for her and thought she was the greatest. And he, he even made jokes about the idea of marrying her and everything. There's the idea of Sylphie, which he was saying that he was going to you know stay at her side and mold her into the, the perfect childhood friend. But, but in the end, he, it wasn't like he was romantic with her. He knew that she was a kid. It was just, okay, maybe down in the future, she'll be that childhood friend that will be devoted to me, whatever. And even he noted that when Paul sent him off, yeah, I, I was kind of making her probably a little bit too dependent on me. So it's probably a good idea that I get away from her. It isn't until we get to this later point that we are finally seeing where Rudius was accepting the idea of becoming family with Edis. The idea of devoting himself to Edis. But again, that unfortunate day after, that... Edis was avoiding him following her because she wanted to get stronger. That's where everything breaks. And now we're finally seeing that mended. 
finally seen it come together. There is a side of me that I'm kind of appreciative of the fact that they didn't spend too much time really rehashing that. It, it's great that Rudia sent that letter, explain the situation, so she gets both sides of that at that point. Gets to see what she did to him and what he got from that and what he's done in the reverse. And in the end, they don't have to rehash that. When they finally get face to face, there is still an issue with communication because again, he's qualifying way too much, providing information that is just stampering her prospects of even being with him. And she doesn't know how to communicate enough that she's forcing it into a situation of a duel just to get the answer from him. And it all works out in the end because that is Edis. This is how Edis thinks. Edis thinks, Edis struggles with thinking a lot. <laughs> and her way of kind of resolving it is to make it very black and white. Raise your staff at me or I defeat you. Give me your answer. I just want a yes or no. I don't care that you have two wives right now. You've told me that three times. I don't care about that stuff. What I want to know, will you love me? Circle yes or no. That's all she cares about. And Roos is too busy trying to qualify it because he doesn't want to ruin what he already has or give her the wrong impression. So it is still kind of a, a struggle in the end. But like I said, it is massively rewarding in the end for those that are empathetic to what Edis has gone through and what she's unfortunately broke without thinking about it. If you think about it, Edis doesn't understand that she broke something. In the end, Edis didn't know that. She was a child. We don't prosecute people when they get older for mistakes they'd done when they were young. Edis made a mistake when she was young. A mistake that she did not know that she did. And it is tragic that while she was away for so long, she was unknowing that that mistake turned into her losing her opportunity for him. But thanks to the power of Harems, she's able to get a foot back in that situation. And so it's her finally to get what she'd been waiting for for literally five years. Because again, like I said, when she parted ways with him, she said that she'd thirst for him. And so for after five years, she finally gets to be with him. <laughs> and she went at it. It was funny. I could totally see that, like this conversation happening between Sylphie, Roxy, and 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 Edis. And, and like every like few minutes, she goes, but can I have him tonight? Oh, okay. Okay. So that's how that works. Okay. So this is how he works. Okay. So that's who, the, okay. So you have a schedule. Okay. But is it my night tonight? Uh, okay. Yeah. Cool. I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh, yeah. That, that's fine. Uh, but can I tonight? Okay, so yeah, so this is how you take care of Lucy. If I have to take care of her, that's fine. That's where this food's at. Okay, but I can have a night. <laughs> I can see you're totally doing that the entire time. <laughs> Listening intently, but then asking every two seconds. And then eventually they're like, yeah, you, yes, we said like five times. Yes, you could have him tonight. That's fine. Roxy can't right now. And <laughs> you can and I, that's fine. Uh, it's great. But yeah, that's, that's, that's chapter 10, 11. I'm going to call it there because while 12 is pretty short, it does technically fit into 13 from what I glanced, and there is a lot to talk about. So I'm, I have a feeling that 12 and 13 might just be their own thing, but we'll see. But I appreciate you guys dropping by as usual. Thank you guys so much for dropping by for the premiere. Hey, chat, hope you guys did well. Hopefully you guys didn't get in trouble for, for putting spoilers in there like usual. But I appreciate you guys for dropping by, and your, your support has been massive. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And yes, as per usual, greatly, greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, all that stuff. It it means a great deal to me. It's because of you guys that this keeps going. It is what provides for the lights to stay on and me to continue this journey down with Shuko Tensei and then to on to other things if we do that. But <laughs> anyways... Thank you guys for dropping by. I hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday. And until the next Mashuka Mondays. Oh, sorry. I almost forgot. Y'all take care. Why, if it isn't white, why, while a miracle, her waist was so slender. Catch up a few, catch up, a, catch up on the last few years. Maybe he had grown up a bit more. Maybe he had grown a bit more. Yes, I'll take good of care. I'm willing to rent a room. Yeah. He wasn't. Yeah. He, yeah. he wish he hadn't said that. Her seeing him experiment with the dessert. This did the magic. Edis must have learned to think. Happy Mushoku Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek, the Mushoku Tensei Tom. <laughs>